So let's now work on an example. So let's say that the problem we're dealing with has two blocks, one stacked on top of the other. So M1 is on top, M2 at the bottom. Let's say that we apply force to the bottom block. Let's suppose that there is no friction between M2 and the floor, but there is friction between M1 and M2. So that friction, let's say that we describe it with the parameters mu sub s for static friction and mu sub k for the kinetic friction. The question that uh, we want to study here is what is the maximum value of the force F so that M1 does not slide? Now let's think about this situation for a minute. Suppose that we apply a very small force to these two blocks. Given the fact that the bottom block does not have friction with the floor, we know that no matter how small the force F is, we will make the system accelerate. We will have an acceleration A, and there is no why, there's no reason why you would expect the block on top to slide on the bottom block. The acceleration seems gentle enough so that both blocks are able to move together. It is only when the applied force to M2 is very large, larger than a certain value that we need to find, it's only when that force here is very large that you would expect M1 to slide on top of M2. Imagine that you take a large hammer and hit M2 very hard with a hammer. In a case like that, you would expect M2 to move quickly from under M1 and M1 to remain pretty much in place. This is similar to the case that we discussed with the tablecloth trick. If you pull the tablecloth fast enough, e M1 will not be able to keep up the motion, the glass on top of the tablecloth will not be able to keep up with the motion of the tablecloth and you will be able to uh, take the tablecloth off from underneath the glass. So this is a similar case with large force F you would expect M2 to move so quickly that M1 will not be able to follow given the fact that M1 is not attached to M2, there's only friction uh, between them. So clearly there must be some maximum value for the force and if we exceed, if the applied force is bigger than maximum value, then M1 will slide. That's what we're dealing with in this problem. So let's assume now that the blocks are moving together. If the blocks are moving together, then as we've seen before, we can define our object of interest as being composed of M1 plus M2. If this is our object of interest, then finding the, the acceleration with which both blocks move is pretty simple. For the object of interest, we have only the table and the force F touching it. So a free body diagram of the object of interest would have the normal force between uh, the object of interest and the table. It will have the force of gravity, M1 plus M2 times G and we have the force F acting to the right. This is, these are all the forces acting on our object of interest. This immediately tells us that Newton's second law applied to the object of interest, F equals M1 plus M2 times A. This tells us that uh, from Newton's second law, F should be equal to M1 plus M2 times the acceleration. Therefore, the acceleration is F divided by M1 plus M2. So provided that the force, the applied force, is not greater than a certain maximum value that we are yet to determine, then the acceleration of the two blocks as they move together will be F divided by M1 plus M2. Now to understand why there should be a maximum value for the force F before M1 starts to slide, we need to explore the dynamics of each block. We have to investigate what are the forces acting on each block independently and then figure out if there is some limit to uh, the value of the forces or the accelerations that these objects can have. So let's start with the block M1. Let's redraw the blocks M1 on top, M2. And now we want to choose as our object of interest M1. So now X and Y axis for M1. One is a dot in the middle in the origin of the X and the Y axis. What are the forces acting on M1? We'll think first about 
the objects that are in contact with M1. M2 is in contact with M1, so that means that M2 can provide a normal force. You can call that the normal force that 2 puts on 1. It also, uh, you also have the weight of M1, and in addition to this, there is a tangential component of the contact force between M1 and M2. The normal component we called it N2 on 1. The tangential component is the static friction between M1 and M2. Once again, we need to figure out in which direction is the static friction acting on M1. Is it going to be that way or is it going to be this way? If you think that, if you realize that uh, at this point we've said that the acceleration of the two systems is to the right, then definitely the friction between 1 and 2 must be the one responsible for allowing M1 to keep up with M2, for giving M1 the same acceleration as M2. So the static friction acting on M1 should be a force pointing to the right. This is the force that 2 puts on 1. You could also determine this uh, direction and just to practice uh, what we've done before, uh, by thinking about the motion of uh, 1 with respect to 2. If there was no friction between 1 and 2, for an observer standing on M2, block 1 would move to the left. That tells you that the direction in which the friction is going to act is to the right. Remember, the force, static force, that 2 puts on 1 is opposite to the velocity that 1 would have with respect to 2 if there was no friction. The direction of 1 with respect to 2 if there is no friction is to the left. So the direction of the force of friction is to the right. So this completes the free body diagram for system M1, which tells us that the sum of the forces in the x direction should be equal to the mass in 1 times the acceleration, the only force acting in the x direction is the static force that 2 puts on 1, and that should be equal to M1A. In the y direction, we have that the sum of the forces should be equal to 0, because the acceleration in the y direction is 0. So this tells us that the normal force that 2 puts on 1 should be exactly equal to the weight of M1. Now we can combine these two equations by using the fact that static friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal. So static friction between 2 and 1 requires the normal force between 2 and 1. That is M1g, so we can replace mu s times M1g and this should be equal to M1a. M1 cancels, and the acceleration of the block on top should be equal to mu sub s times g. Notice that this is the maximum acceleration possible, because the force of friction in general can be, should be less and at most equal to mu sub s times uh, the normal force. So in the case where you replace with an equality, you are implicitly talking about the maximum value that the force of friction can have, which gives you the maximum value that the acceleration can be. So this is, uh, you should be reminded here of the problem that we discussed with Usain Bolt, and we calculated the maximum acceleration that a runner can have given the coefficient of static friction between the shoes and the road. So this is a similar calculation, or an identical calculation. And once again, the maximum acceleration that M1 can have, because only friction is acting on it, is mu sub s, the coefficient of static friction, times g. So this is a breakthrough for this problem, because now we have come to a point where we realize that there is a limitation in the motion of M1 the acceleration of M1 is limited by the amount of friction between 1 and 2. 
it is impossible for M1 to accelerate with an acceleration greater than mu sub s times g. So, so far we have determined that the acceleration that block M1 can have has a maximum value. In this kind of situation, M1 will never be found to have an acceleration that surpasses mu sub s times g. Now the acceleration of the system as a whole is equal to the amount of force applied to it divided by the total mass of the system. So for the system to move as a whole, the acceleration of both M1 and M2 together cannot surpass the value mu sub s times g. So we can replace the maximum value of the acceleration mu sub s times g make it equal to f maximum divided by m1 plus m2. So this tells us that the maximum value of the applied force so that m1 does not slide on top of m2 should be equal to m1 plus m2 multiplied by mu sub s times g.